Okay, everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. We're excited to host this presentation on anti fascism and disability uh, by Moss Williams. It was originally planned as a presentation for the Another Carolina Anarchist uh, Book Fair last month. Um, and when that didn't work out, we pivoted to virtual, which I think was uh, was a great move. And I'm excited uh, for all the folks who are now able to attend that wouldn't have been here if it had been in person. Uh, Firestorm is a 15-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. Uh, we're continuing to do a lot of our events online, uh, both because we love to reach people at a distance and because we know that COVID remains a barrier for participation for so many. Uh, tomorrow, in fact, uh, if you have time to join us, we are logging on for our consent culture workshop with activist and author Kitty Stryker. If you're interested in learning about any of our upcoming events, you can follow us on social media and I'll share some links to like our newsletter and stuff like that. So please note that this afternoon we are using Zoom's Q&A tool. Uh, if you wanna ask a question at any point, uh, you can go ahead and write that out. Um, you don't have to wait till the end. Um, it's probably located at the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Uh, okay, so we're gonna get started. Uh, just so you know, today's event was a fundraiser for Disability Visibility Project, and we've raised about $210, which is great. Uh, if you weren't able to chip in during registration, but you want to do that now, I'll drop a link in the chat so that you can find your way over there. Moss Williams is uh, a disabled, non-binary, anti-fascist, uh, and abolitionist organizer, writer, and artist. They've traveled all over the U.S. and Canada doing workshops on disability, anti-fascism, philosophy, and self-defense. They've also written a soon-to-be-published essay for the Anarchism and Punk Book Project, and I'll share a link to that as well in the chat. Uh, Moss, thanks so much for being here today, and I'm going to pass off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's exciting, all the people that are here. Um, I I did dress up a little bit. I I talk about it in my essay, the the um, theater kid thing. I I don't apologize. I think it looked cute. Um, so let me share my screen here. Doop, doop, doop. All right, can you see that okay? Okay, great. So first I want to just talk about the references. I made it in the picture here so you can see all the books behind me because I want everyone to make sure that they know that I'm, I'm working off of information that's been written before me, um, a lot of it by um, black and brown folks who I wanna make sure that their voices are not, um, their work on the, these issues is not forgotten about. So I'm just gonna keep these books behind me right here so that you know that this is where a lot of the information that I am pulling from has come from and just keep that in mind. Um, so I'm gonna be doing a lot of quoting. I didn't have as much time to polish this as I would have liked because being disabled right now is really hard. I mean, it always is hard, but it's like especially difficult right now, and it's been hard. So I didn't get to polish this as much as I liked. So uh, ap appreciate um, the understanding with the like absolute crap graphics. <laughs> so okay, so framework first off, uh, what is fascism? If we're talking about anti-fascism, we should probably define fascism. And there are a lot of different definitions of fascism. So um, for this talk, we're gonna be exploring, uh, this is the classic, this definition of fascism by Roger Griffin. It's called palingenetic ultranationalism. Right? This is quoted right off of Wikipedia. So if you're already like, can't read all that, that is fine. You can go look it up on Wikipedia under Roger Griffin. Um, a key element is the belief that fascism, you know what? I forgot to do a visual thing. I'm sorry, hold on, let's pause. Um, I look, I am a white person wearing a black shirt that says anti-fascist anti -fascist action on it. I'm wearing a gray KN95 and um, sunglasses with flowers on the edges and a black 
uh, baseball cap and uh, head headset and microphone. Oh, and the microphone was up. Can you hear me now better, probably? Okay. <laughs> in my background, I've got a, a red anti-fascist flag with some mold on it because it's I'm retired and it's been in my closet. So, um, and a queer anarchist flag and a transgender flag and a stack of books, um, including The Viral Underclass by Stephen W. Thrasher, The Future is Disabled, Prophecies, Love Notes, and Morning Songs by Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarsina. Um, not in order. Uh, All Our Trials by Emily L. Thuma, Capitalism and Disability, Selected Writings by Marta Russell, uh, The Nazi Doctors by Robert J. Lifton, no More Police by Miriam Kaba and Andrea J. Ritchie. Superior, The Return of Race Science by Angela Saini. Uh, Confronting Fascism, Discussion Documents for a Militant Movement. Yeah, okay. That was the visual description. I'll continue on. Um, so the true core myth of fascism, namely that the need for a counter-revolution to occur first before a national rebirth or palingenesis could then take place. Griffin argues that the unique synthesis of palingenesis and ultranationalism differentiates fascism from parafascism and other authoritarian nationalist ide ideologies. Um, and so we're going to come back around to this. So just stick that in your pocket um, and understand that nationalism sometimes means within count, um, country boundaries, but it can also mean a political or a cultural or an identity boundary. So for instance, white nationalism is about the border, the border that is whiteness, and then the na national identity is tied to being white, not necessarily to a country like the United States or something, although there's a lot of overlap there. All right, so the second definition of fascism, and this is one that people throw out a lot, is fascism as capitalism in crisis. And this is an older definition that um, is talking more about the original creation of fascism in Italy and Germany in the uh, early of the 20th century. Um, so as capitalism has, uh, capitalism was not totally figured out yet and they were still getting out, massaging out the issues with capitalism, the capitalists were. So at this point, capitalism in crisis is not a very good definition of fascism. If you wanna read more about that, I suggest the Don Hammerquist um essays and also uh jay sakai has talked about this and i talk about in the confronting fascism i will actually read this right now so um one of the things that jay sakai says and he's referencing hammerquist is uh it's flipping a new page to think of fascism as a rebellious oppositional force to u.s capitalism so that's important to remember um, we've got two different kind of strains of fascism happening, which is at the governmental scale on the sort of national scale, but also we've got a revolutionary fascist strain that is anti-capitalist. And that is something that if you're only looking at fascism as something that happened in the early 20th century, that you might be missing. So fascism as capitalism in crisis is not a good definition anymore. Um, I You can also read Disaster Capitalism by Naomi Klein. I didn't read that book. I want to. I did read this really great Teen Vogue article, though, um, about <laughs> what is disaster capitalism. Um, and it's just the idea that capitalism's figured that out now. Like, disasters, they, capitalists know how to take disasters and, like, reabsorb them into capitalism in order to make money off of them. Now, this becomes very important when we're talking about disability and the frameworks of fascism now. So, again, just remember this. We're going to come back to it. Um, the other definition of fascism, this one is by Jay Sakai. I got that out of that same book, Confronting Fascism. Um, it's a crisis of white settlerism. And I like this one. Um, this also came up in, I didn't put this in the original risk because I didn't take too much from it, but uh, there's an essay in here I like from the No Pass or Run, um, Anti-Fascist Dispatches from a World in Crisis by author uh, Janelle K. Hope. I'm going to read that real quick. Um, it's part of that, the Black anti-fascist tradition, a primer. So beyond its manifestations in the U.S., fascism has been embedded within colonization and imperialism. For hundreds of years, European colonials were able to develop an authoritarian political rule 
across Africa, Asia, and Latin America that deemed the continent's indigenous peoples inherently inferior and enslavable. Okay, so understanding colonialism as the basis of capitalism, eugenics, race, science, and climate disaster altogether is a much, uh, I think, a much better, easier to understand framework in a lot of ways. When you pull it back past the beginning of capitalism to the beginning of colonialism, that's because a lot of these threads start there and then kind of diverge. So if you're trying to think about fascism just as an issue with capitalism, you it's very easy to end up missing the connections it has with um, race, science, and eugenics and climate disaster. So if you don't kind of pull all these pieces together, it's very easy to end up with a flawed analysis that um, can actually further some fascist goals. So you got to be really careful. So um, I put in here, including pandemics. I have another book here that I haven't finished reading, so I didn't include it, but I'm in the middle of reading. It. It's called Rationalizing Epidemics. Ooh, I don't know how to, sh like, okay, Zoom doesn't want to show it to you. Sorry. Uh, anyway, it's by David S. Jones, and uh, I'm going to read from that. So um, it's about how pandemics and uh, viral biological war warfare has been part of colonialism from the very beginning. Most of us know this kind of vaguely about smallpox, right, about smallpox and the indigenous geno genocide of the quote-unquote Americas. Um, I'm just going to read this real quick. So health disparities have puzzled observers for centuries. Throughout history, people have recognized that some populations are healthier or sicker than others. This recognition has triggered a an enduring phenomenon, the rationalization of epidemics. Obser observers have to explain patterns in the disease environment, why epidemics strike when they do and why they strike some populations more severely than others. Epidemics must be made understandable, meaningful, and rational. Even as societies struggle to assign meaning to health disparities, epidemics demand responses from the populations they strike. Some people work to mitigate the effects of epidemics while others seek to profit from victims' losses. Individual choices reflect intersections of medical theory, economic necessity, racial ideology, political opportunism, and the lived experiences of everyday life. As health disparities are made rational, interventions are rationalized. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, but basically, epidemics have been part of colonialism since the beginning. And since epidemics have been there, rationalization of why those epidemics are hurting some people more than others has also existed and so you can take that all the way back there's roots of this all the way back in colonialism okay so moving forward so i am going through just like a lot of information really quickly so i hope you do stay at the end for the unrecorded part where we can have more of a question answer um like discussion because uh this is a huge subject and i'm going to do my best to kind of like give the most important frameworks parts of it so um and moss sorry to interrupt but that yeah. last quotation that you just shared could you say again yeah. the source where that came from yes that is page three of rationalizing epidemics meanings and uses of american indian mortality since 1600 by david s jones and again, I haven't finished this book, but um, it's it goes through the history of how white settlers have reacted to the just absolute disasters they're creating through um, um, intentional and unintentional biological warfare upon indigenous populations. So that'll be, I feel like there's going to be more uh, overlap with now than it's going to be easy to read. So Okay, so how is the construction of disability inherent to the creation of colonialism and into fascism? I, I put my speaker's notes in the slides because I couldn't figure it out with the sharing on Zoom, so uh, that's fine. Where is it? There it is. Ooh, okay, okay. Okay, stack of books. All right, so this is from Superior 2 and 3. So, um, with um, colonialism came the Enlightenment, and with the Enlightenment became the creation of 
hierarchies of nature. Um, we can talk, we're going to talk about Carl Linnaeus. He comes up a lot and he's an asshole. So um, I'm going to read this quote here. By the 19th century, those who didn't live like Europeans were thought not yet to have fully realized their potential as human beings. Wow. Okay. Even now, uh, poor uh, researcher notes that when scientists discuss human origins, he still catches them describing Homo sapiens as better and faster than and superior to other human species, easily interpreted as economic terms. I don't know what that means. There is an implicit assumption that higher productivity and more mastery over nature, the presence of settlements and cities, are the marks of human progress, even of the evolution of mankind. The more superior we are to nature, the more superior we are as humans. It's a way of thinking that still forces a ranking of people from closer to nature to more distant, from less developed to more, from worse to better. So we start seeing these like creations during the Enlightenment of um, settlers coming upon people who live differently than they do and deciding to rationalize why their way of life was better and by doing so deciding who was human and who wasn't human so um race is a creation of the enlightenment um we're going to talk so Linnaeus the notion that race was a hard and fixed feature that people couldn't choose and essence passed down to their children came slowly in large part from enlightenment science the 18th century Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus famous for classifying the national world the natural world from the tiniest insects to the biggest beasts turned his eyes to humans if flowers could vary by color and shape then perhaps human could also be classified into groups in the 10th edition of Systema Naturae a catalog he published in 1758 Linnaeus laid out the categories we still use today. He listed four main categories of human corresponding to the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, respectively. So all the content warnings. I hope you know, I hope you, I should have said this at the beginning, but like this is a talk on fascism and uh, the topics are terrible and sucks. So uh, please be taking care of yourselves. <laughs> like this is really triggering horrible stuff, okay? I'm going to put my hand on my heart here for just a second. And I hope you will follow along if you need to. Please take breaks, drink water. Uh, get some food. Uh, I'm just going to tear through the whole history of why everything is falling apart and horrible right now. So, you know, it's not like fun. Um, so, uh, where was I? Okay, yeah. Respectively, and each is easy to spot by their color. Red, white, yellow, and black. Uh, categorizing humans became a never-ending business. Every gentleman scholar, and they were almost exclusively men, drew up his own dividing lines, some going with a few as a couple of races, others with dozens or more. Many never saw the people they were describing, instead relying on secondhand accounts from travelers or just hearsay. Linnaeus himself included two separate subcategories within his Systema Naturae, monster-like humans and feral humans. Okay, so remember that. Yeah. Um, during the Enlightenment, during the 1800s, and up through the period of colonialism of early colonialism we're still in colonialism but of early colonialism you saw things like human zoos where people were categorized as non-human or subhuman and held in zoos with animals um, which is a form of incarceration of animals and of people they're all kind of like related that's sort of the point of all this is like a lot of these things are related um <sighs> yeah uh, a note from here, page 29 of Superior by Angela Saini. Grouping people made it easier to control them. Pretty to the point. Okay. Yep, and that brings us to eugenics, where uh, that's turn of the century. We get Francis Galton, who was uh, another fucking asshole. Um, in the early population control movement. So... In its early days, particularly for its mainstream supporters, eugenics focused on improving the racial stock by weeding out those at the margins, the feeble-minded, the insane, and the disabled. Okay, so we see the beginning of eugenics and the beginning of the creation of race, and ableism is tied up to all of it, right? So eugenics was who's human and who's not a human, and then also what humans are even worthy of life or attention or care right so 
the very beginnings of eugenics focused on, again, the feeble-minded, the insane, and the disabled, right? And you have to remember that the way that those are classified um, strongly is related to the creation of race and who is who is considered feeble-minded, who is being disabled by colonialism, um, whose different practices are considered insane. Okay, so for a long time, being gay up until like the 70s or 80s was considered a form of insanity. Being trans is still considered a form of insanity. Um, and being marginalized is disabling, right? If you've just had your entire society and all your people killed, if you've been, ha a virus has gone rampant and has lots of devastating after effects, like you're more likely to be disabled. Now, one thing I didn't put in here, which is an interesting story, is um, the story of the hookworm in the American South. Um, the hookworm was very prevalent and it causes all sorts of like neurological issues if you have hookworms and you get hookworms through your feet. So there were a lot of enslaved people um, who didn't have shoes, who were working in fields and in mud, who ended up with hookworm and ended up with neurological issues. And uh, the, those neurological issues were then um, used to say that Black people are stupid and um, uh, feeble-minded, etc. So... Um, there was a huge campaign to get rid of hookworms and it was severe, it was super, super pushed back on by um, white supremacists and uh, like slave owners and post slave owners in the South. Um, so that's an interesting side note that I meant to put in here and forgot to. So um, this of course brings us to the Nazis. It started, however, in the Americas. This is uh, the United States of America was one of the first real, real strong players in the eugenics movement. So I'm reading now from The Nazi Doctors by Robert J. Lifton. Uh, I won't show it to you. It's okay. It's, it's in the picture somewhere. Oh yeah, it's down there. Okay. So it was the United States that a relatively simple form of vasectomy was developed at a penal institution around the turn of the century. This procedure, together with a rising interest in eugenics, led by 1920 to the enactment of laws in 25 states providing for compulsory sterilization of the criminally insane and other people considered genetically inferior. Right? So again, criminally insane, genetically inferior, uh, the way that uh, race is created. There had been plenty of racial eugenic passions in the United States, impulses to sterilize large numbers of criminals and mental patients out of fear of national degeneration and of threat to the health of the civilized races who were seen to be biologically plunging downward. So again, you'll see that these things are always tied together. How you define race, that race is a really relatively new concept. How you define disabled, um, those things are all tied together. Um, yeah, RIP, I just want to put a little RIP in for baby Nauer. Um, she was the first victim of um, the Nazi genocides in in um, Germany. She was a physically disabled child who was euthanized and was the was the first victim of that euthanization. So just a little note in the history books to remember her. Uh, eugenics and the body politic. So this is the concept of the Volkskörper. So we're talking about bodies. The the interesting thing about Nazi Germany was the way that they understood um, the body and uh, purity of the body and cleanliness of the body and the body as part of um, the idea of the Volkskörper. Pretend I put an umlaut in there. I didn't bother. Um, so the Volkskörper is... Uh, the physician was to be concerned with the health of the folk even more than with individual disease and was to teach them to overcome the old individualistic principle of the right to one's own body and embrace instead the duty to be healthy. Uh, national socialism is nothing but applied biology. So there were, of any profession, there were more doctors in uh, the National Socialist Party than any other profession because 
the idea of the Volkskörper and of the po body politic was so important to the Nazi philosophy of racial hygiene, right? And that it was your, it was an individual duty to protect the body of the people. And this, you know, this can sound okay, sort of like the way that we, I mean, I didn't, I didn't mean it like that, but I mean, like the way that like you do need, like you need to take, that's what's so interesting and hard about fascism is they take things that like hit you like, oh yeah, that sounds like it makes sense. But then the way that it's twisted and used um, is the issue. So like it's the individual's right. We need to take care of the body politic, which means that we need to, um, it doesn't mean like we need to have strong public health measures that keep everyone safe. What they mean is then it's like we need to use that ethic to then cleanse the state of undesirables that we have defined. So, yeah, uh, they called they called people who were disabled useless eaters. Um, and just a uh, reminder that this is all based in anti-blackness. I just want to keep bringing that up. Uh, read Thrasher 8. OK, so now I'm reading out of the viral underclass by Stephen Thrasher which I'm going to be reading from a lot, was very influential in this talk. Okay, because racism and colonialism spread diseases around the world. Oh, let me try again. Because racism and colonialism, A, spread diseases around the world, B, created living conditions for black and indigenous people in which diseases spread, and C, devalued black lives such that illness wasn't treated or prevented, White settlers and later white Americans associated sickness with blackness and their own health with distance from it. Indeed, racial health disparities have been maintained over time in ways that make white health dependent on people of color being inversely unwell. Right. In the COVID-19 pandemic, white people's ability to work relatively safely at home was possible only because disproportionately black and brown delivery drivers, food workers, and shoppers made it possible, too often sacrificing their own health and lives in the process. Okay. Um, incarceration as an extension of eugenics. So, uh, more from Thrasher. The carceral state is one of the most potent vectors of an under underclass deemed disposable and unworthy of care or health. And um, RIP to another just shout out to Ricky Ray Rector, who was a convicted murderer um, that the Clinton campaign made a big who like bruja over seeing killed um, by the state. He was a convicted murderer so cognitively unaware of his own impending death that he left the pecan pie dessert from his final meal uneaten because he was saving it for later. Um, rates of HIV among incarcerated individuals are eight to 10 times higher. Levels of TB in prisons has been reported to be up to a hundred times higher than that of the civilian population. County jails, state prisons, federal ICE detention centers would become powerful vectors of the novel coronavirus and still are. Um, so what does this have to do with disability? Well, first off, getting a virus like this is disabling, right? Any of these, TB will kill you, HIV will kill you if left untreated. Um, any of these, if left untreated. Um, a lot of times folks are getting multiple things at a time that are disabling. Um, you can be have get viruses that are reactivating. Um, so, um, read C and D, oh, this is the wrong button. C and D. Okay, now I'm going to be reading out of ugh, Capitalism and Disability, Selected Writings by Marta Russell, who is a disabled activist and communist, actually. Um, so, um, if we think about incarceration, so again, going all the way back, there's this concept that there's this, like, amount of people that are expendable and not only expendable but need to be gotten rid of in order to keep the health of the body politic white settlers are defining their health in contrast to the sickness of black and brown and disabled people right so i'm just trying to build this story here that is the story that we need to understand to understand what's happening right now within the covid pandemic okay um, I hope people are asking questions. I'm not checking. I'm just 
ranting. So, um, how does this have to do with um, incarceration? Comes in many forms. There is the kind that we understand the easiest, the best, like jail, prison, detention centers, right? But there is also incarceration of the mentally ill, of physically disabled, of elderly in group situations that are um, not based in consent or helping folks necessarily. They're based in getting this population out of sight. Um, so I'm going to read this book here. Um, in the U.S., eugenics policy focused on the incarcerated population, developing into an entire science of criminal anthropology. Physical characteristics were linked to criminal behavior and disabled people were said to be predisposed to commit crimes. A 1911 textbook on treating disabled people stated, a failure in the moral training of a cripple means the evolution of an individual detestable in character, a menace and burden to the community who is only too apt to graduate into the mendicant and criminal classes. And like that definitely describes some of my best friends. Um, I'm very proud. Um, but also uh, you can kind of see how engaging disability, criminality, um, um, anti-blackness, all kind of come, are put, blackness, criminality, disability are all kind of put into this box together of people that we want to get rid of, that are uh, ruining society, that are causing a lack of health. So like health is tied up into these ideas, right? Um, And uh, this goes on to, I don't need to read that right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So care facilities as incarceration, doop, doop, doop. going back to Thrasher. The first major outbreak of COVID-19 was at a nursing home in Washington state. Star, that's not a number. Oh, I think I forgot what number I was on when I was marking these. Oh, star, okay. <clears throat> This is a, a quote from Alice Wong, disability right, uh, justice activist. So, the first major outbreak was at a nursing home in Washington state, she recalled, referring to the life care center of Kirkland where 35 people died. This is another disability thing where these congregate settings such as prisons, such as nursing homes are really traps, right? People are trapped. Talk about your viral underclass. Most people in long-term care facilities, whether because of age or a disability, don't have other options. Unlike people in cities with professional jobs who choose to flee to the countryside and work remotely, people in care homes don't have anywhere else to go. As Alice explained, we live in a system that supports institutions more than community-based living. And uh, as you know, with the history of HIV, she told me, high risk, that's kind of a dog whistle, right? It's shorthand for certain populations that are just considered expendable. Queers, crips, people who are too promiscuous or too fat, people who have let themselves get too sick or become too elderly, right? People who are sick, their lives are better off dead. That's a very real sentiment, Alice said, explaining it as genocide by other names. Yeah, hiding people from, hiding from view certain people who don't count is part of why so many people are kept in congregate settings in the United States in the first place. In her 2009 book, The Ugly Laws, Disability in Public, University of California Berkeley professor Sue Schweik wrote that for more than a century, cities had laws like San Francisco's 1867 ordinance that forbade any person who was diseased, maimed, mutilated, or deformed in any way so as to be unsightly or disgusting object from exposing himself or herself to public view. Now, I want to note that this is this this is the discourse that's happening around having trans people in public, um, especially having trans women in public. And uh, this is all it's tied to disability. It's tied to seeing being transgender as mentally as a mental illness. Um, and then what do we do with people who are mentally ill? We throw them in incarceration, right? That's the that's the that's the general uh, take from our society, which is pretty cool. So those ugly laws are technically not on the books, but people want them back. And uh, they're still acted upon by whenever anyone's fighting to say who can police who in public for what they look like. Um, and this is the same thing that's happening also with masks, right? It's like, well, you're wearing a mask. It's stressing me out. And I so like, I think that's ugly. 
and it's stressing me out and it's a sign of sickness or illness, even if it's not, but it's a, it reminds me of sickness or illness. So I don't want to see it. And it's my right, especially as like a white settler to feel comfortable at all times. Therefore, um, I am not wanting your mask in public. So this, this strain of thought goes way back to ugly laws. Um, and now we're going to, uh, disability as a profit resource. So um, thinking back on those definitions of fascism that we're talking about. Um, so since if fascism is not capitalism in crisis, if capitalism has figured it out, then like, what does that mean? So capitalism sees you as a resource, whether or not you are working. Uh, labor as a separate concept or separate grouping from material resources is a false binary. People are the resources. People are seen as resources, uh, alive, sick, or dead. And remember also that many humans are not seen as people, right? That it, to those upper class, there's still that framework that exists that it, only a certain type of people really are human and that everyone else is kind of subhuman. And that's the way that we uh, rationalize epidemics and poor treatment. Um, so if you can be a resource, even if you're not working, like what does that mean? Um, first off, I'm going to read more of Marta Russell. Doop, doop, doop. One. Uh, this is a essay called Handy Capitalism makes its debut. Uh, the handy capitalist philosophy is that disabled people should not be viewed as charity cases or regulatory burdens, but as profitable marketing targets. So where is all the consumer-driven buying power the handy capitalists rave about? It certainly does not rest within the 11 million working age, blind, deaf, developmentally disabled, or mobility impaired people who are unemployed, living on SSDI or SSI, and not earning fat salaries on the upwardly mobile track. The equally important question is how much of the money being spent on disability-specific needs and products is under the control of the disabled individual. It is most likely that the real buying power resides with government agencies who make purchases for disabled individuals under programs such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the Department of Rehabilitation, or with private insurance companies. Rather than the buying power being in the hands of the disabled consumer, these agencies make the purchases on behalf of their disabled clients. The decision-making power is far removed from the disabled individual. And in fact, disabled people are kept in are forced to be in poverty in the United States. If you're getting certain kinds of uh, social security disability, you're not allowed to have more than $2,000 in your account at any time. You are kept in poverty. So clearly you are not the buying power that is being incentivized. And I just wanna show a clip right now from um, Love of My Life, Imani Barbarin. Um, I've actually never met her, but I maybe have a little crush. Okay, uh, how do I do this? Let's see. Screen sharing, exit that, and so this. Now I couldn't, we couldn't figure out the audio, so I'm really sorry. But there are captions, so I'm gonna play it without the captions. This person said, "I got vaccine boosted. Wasn't there another booster shot after the initial one? I probably need to get one. We've been failed by the CDC. Period. Just shows how poorly this has been handled by the government and by the media." People seem to believe that this is like a fumble by the government or the media. No, this was an investment. And that's because of the billionaires in their ear. We talk about the rich and the wealthy in terms of them halting COVID mitigation. But we rarely talk about the other side of it. That is a private equity firms have been buying up disability services as well as investing in guardianship and conservatorship. Um, those terms you may have become familiar with, with Britney Spears, a uh, disabled icon from my youth. I'll, I mean, she's got problems, but also, anyway, continuing, sorry. Lest we not forget the overturn of Roe v. Wade during a mass disabling event. You're valuable as a disabled person, baby. They'll imprison you using the legal system and then you pay them for the pleasure They'll take away all your assets and they'll shove you into a nursing home or long-term care facility where they're cutting corners 
so you're surrounded by death every day. It'll also be easier to take your children from you because disability makes you an unfit parent. Don't you know? Ableism is a closed loop system. If you speak out or try to talk to anybody, they not only control who you talk to, people won't believe you. You're feared or disabled. I'm done wasting my breath trying to get people to understand this. It seems like the best communicator is experience. Literary. Yeah. So yeah, disabled people, we're all like just like kind of trying to scream at everybody right now that like you're being taken into the jaws, <laughs> the maws of this system. Um but it's hard to get people to listen. Yeah, so here's my mini rant. This is my mini rant time. Marginalization is disabling. If you have any sort of marginalization, you are prone to being disabled. You know, long COVID is more common in women. Okay. At least a third of the LGBTQIA2 spirit plus uh, population is disabled. And that's probably, I'm almost certain that's undercounted. And that's rising because we are also more likely to end up with long COVID and post-viral illness symptoms. Whiteness is not going to save you. Okay, uh, whiteness is not a protective factor in the terms of public health. Whiteness is the lack of a risk factor of racism, right? And that's a huge risk factor. Dealing with racism is a huge risk factor. But the difference being that whiteness does not protect you from stuff. It just isn't, it means you aren't dealing with racism, okay? So like, there's a lot, I see just a lot of folks on the left who are kind of acting like none of this matters to them. And those tend to be white folks, uh, not always. Um, but I just just a reminder too, um, just marginalization of any kind is disabling. If you have any identity that is not cishet, rich, straight, white man, then you are at risk of being disabled by the systems. And even those dudes are. So, okay, mini rant over. Solidarity uh solidarity i wanted to share this book with you and it's a really important book it's called all our trials prisons policing and the feminist fight to end violence by emily l Thuma. there's it's a long beautiful history of solidarity between the black indigenous and latina led anti-violence movements and white mad queer women and uh, i'm not a woman anymore but i also uh, was also uh not just women but um gender queer folks and uh queer folks um, there's lots of room. There's like a, a long, beautiful history of solidarity of those movements working together because we're being incarcerated and punished for violence in different ways. Um, uh, the way that, um, as sort of shown by this history, it's like it's it's the same pie that we're dealing with, right? We're being hurt by this. If you have any sort of neurodivergence, if you have any sort of queerness, or if you have any sort of mental health issues, and who doesn't have mental health issues right now? Um, so fight fascism by supporting black, indigenous, Latina, mad queers and be an ally by losing your mind in a, not a racist way, please. Uh, but, um, shutting down incarceration of all kinds, because that is the function. That is the format in which fascism is grinding people and, uh, killing people is that's it's, it's, uh, the Germans went a little overboard and were too, um, open with all the mass killing. Um, America is uh, a little bit more subtle about it and getting away with it and because of this. So um, the systems are built to disable you. And then once you are disabled, you are thrown in jail or in other sorts of incarceration, at which point you become a resource, not from your labor, but a resource uh, for government checks and stuff. And so, um, yeah, this is a quote from Martin Russell. We must create a social order based on equality and order that does not punish those who cannot work, that does not make work the defining measure of our worth, and that offers counter values to the prevailing productionism, which only oppresses us all. Speciesism. Um, this is a tie back to the how the powerful define human and also define worthy of life. Carl fucking Linnaeus. Back to this book. <laughs> Who is considered a human, and by back to this book, I meant The Viral Underclass by Stephen Thrasher. 
Uh, who is considered a human animal or a non-human animal is also highly gendered, racialized, and ableist, with those closest to white, straight maleness being categorized as human, while the rest of us have historically been considered non-human to varying degrees. Right? And, uh, for instance, the um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, is set up to protect workers from the very kinds of risks that meat production workers were facing. Um, besides incarceration in um, in uh, care homes, care homes, um, the next group that was the most um, where is the better quote? I just want to read this better quote. It's, it's true that workers in low-wage jobs of all kinds faced increased viral risk in the pandemic, but people who work with animals face some of the severest risks. Because of how speciesism devalues non-human animals, companies squeeze together too many species into tight spaces and deny them room to live in relation to one another with any sense of equilibrium. This, in turn, places the humans who work with these animals in some of the most dangerous working conditions possible. Um... Okay, so for instance, OSHA is set up to protect workers from these kinds of risks, but when Reuters identified 106 U.S. workplaces where employees complained of slipshod pandemic safety practices around the time of the COVID-19 outbreaks in 2020, a mere 12 resulted in disciplinary action by OSHA by the end of the year. The agency Reuters reported never inspected 70 of those workplaces where at least 4,500 workers were infected by coronavirus and 26 died after contracting COVID-19. Of the work sites Reuter identified, the government largely deserted the workers it deemed the most essential in a majority of the cases at a time when those workers needed protections the most. As with so many other members of the viral underclass, the vulnerability of people who work killing non-human animals is a manufactured as a box of Smithfield fully cooked maple sausage patties. And the justification for consigning people to such damnation, their proximity to am animalness. Yeah, so... Um, did I wait, did I already read the Carl Linnaeus thing? Oh yeah, okay. I don't know where he came in. Oh yeah, taxonomy is the scientific classification of organisms. As the 18th century father of modern taxonomy, Carl Linnaeus classified mammalia as organisms with breasts. As a historian of science, Londa Scheinberger has noted, one of the reasons Linnaeus did this was because at the time, men were defined by their brainy reason, while women were defined by their beastly bodies. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and so, if you focus on environmentalism without understanding the basis of environmental destruction in colonialism, anti-Blackness and ableism, then you're probably just doing a fascism. So, the COVID-19 pandemic was in part caused... Um, Oh, hi, kitten. Um, it's possible that SARS-CoV-2 jumped from bats to some poor person whose livelihood depended on scooping up guano in a remote region, remote region of Central Asia. People have died from it over many years without the virus moving broadly between groups of human before it made its way uh, in 2019 to the Wuhan seafood wholesale market. There it may have spread not through exotic animals for sale, but between human workers and shoppers. People outside the United States who live or work near exotic animals like people farming guano or selling pangolins in China are highly stigmatized and othered by Americans. It is precisely the sort of work the United States and other empires demands, but from which those in power distance themselves. This process, process constitutes a kind of organized abandonment where interests in the United States depend upon such work, even if those in the country pretend not to benefit from it. So um, Stephen Thrasher goes on to make like a really good point that like, um, I don't have a good quote for it, but our destruction of the environment is causing pandemics because we are moving into areas where there have been viruses that have been living just fine among the animals in those areas. And as we destroy that habitat, the viruses are then unleashed. So like environmental degradation has to do, um, I mean, the pandemic itself has to do with the colonial and capitalist need to continually expand and to continually devalue the people who are being forced into those positions of extraction from the environments that are nearest to them because we don't see them as people fully, right? Okay. I need Thrasher 4 and 5. I already did that. Okay. Uh, ecological collapse, what the fuck? I need Leah 1. Leah... 
So, uh, one of the second thesis of this book, now I'm reading The Future is Disabled. We won't be able to survive climate change, the rise of fascism and white supremacy and unending pandemics. We won't be able to create the just future we all still hope for that will show up without disability justice and disabled skills. In the words of my friend and comrade, black disabled trans artist and organizer, Cyrus Marcus Ware, there is no revolution if disabled people aren't in it. I am a pragmatist, I want us to win, and we are not going to win freedom and liberation from all forms of oppression if we do not systemically confront and destroy both internalized and externalized ableism. Um, Talila Lewis, black disability justice writer and organizer and co-founder of HERD, all caps, says, I laugh when people talk about racism and ableism separately. It's literally impossible to take them apart. Um, the working definition of ableism that Lewis has revised for years as of January, 2022 reads, a system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-Blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. The systemic oppression that leads to people in socially society determining people's value based on their culture, age, language, appearance, religion, birth, or living space, health, and wellness, and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Where are we at? Oh, wow. I only got five minutes left. Oh, yeah. So sad personal story time. Um, when the I've been disabled uh, for a long time. And when the pandemic hit, um, I am going to choke up because this is still hard. It's still hard at this point. Um, I It was like validating and also just deeply depressing um how hard everyone was freaking out about having to like be at home alone because that was my life a lot for a long time and it's the experience of disabled people a lot and um just to kind of see like how impossible it was for able people to like to, like sit indoors for like a week or whatever like there was no real lockdown in america like people were, like it's a lockdown like it really really didn't ever happen here um like y'all are not able people are not going to be okay when they become disabled from covid or from from the collapse from all the things that are happening that are leading to disability right um you, like the skills it takes to be disabled are not nothing they're extremely important and the people with those skills are dying like are being killed by this um and like it like literally like you do not know able people do not know what they're getting into do not have the skills to cope are gonna fucking flail around and uh the we're all kind of braced in the disability community for this like oncoming wave of people who have never been disabled before or being disabled by COVID and are going to be like freaking out and wanting our help after years of just like abandonment. So uh, if you could admit that you need our help because we have those skills and then just help us from fucking dying, that would be great. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So that gets us to COVID. It's still here. I hear from people all the time that like, oh, I thought COVID was over. I thought it was gone because our 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 leaders uh, were like, oh, pandemic's over, right? No, pandemic is over for the ultra rich, you guys. When they say the pandemic is over, they mean it's for the ultra ultra rich. Um, COVID never left. It's still here. It's not less damaging. That's a lie. There is no reason that uh, a disease or a virus will get less will like be less bad over time it just evolves in random ways that's how evolution works it just mutates and evolves in random ways and the more prevalent it is the more chances it has to evolve right so like sometimes pandemics will disappear i think a lot of folks are thinking that this is like the flu pandemic uh, like the spanish flu pandemic which actually started in kansas so we should call it the kansas flu pandemic after world war one which lasted about two years and then was gone like that's cool um but that is not there's no reason why a virus has to be like that the black plague 
lasted uh, 600, 800, 1,000 years. <laughs> you know, there's like no reason why it's not going to get less bad, right? The COVID that's still out there right now is just as deadly, okay? People are dying from it all the time. I saw an estimate that they're expecting up to maybe about 200,000 deaths just this season, just this season, okay? And a lot of those people who are dying are vaccinated because our vaccines for COVID are not that good. <laughs> like, they're fine. They will keep you from dying, usually, which is great. However, um, it's not the smallpox. It's not the MMR, which are like one and done. You get the shot. You don't ever get the disease and you're good for life. Like that's kind of a miracle and amazing. But we haven't figured that out yet for flu or for the COVID coronaviruses. Okay. So like um, I'm going to show you real quick this biobot data. Now um, we're going to pretend people are pretending that the, it's gone. It's done. So um, this is year over year wastewater information now why are we taking wastewater information so man i'm gonna go over it's okay I, you know what? we're gonna do q q a in just a minute but like if you just want to keep the recording going so i can finish out this part on covid um then we'll do question and answer i'll i'll wrap it up pretty quick um so we're not tracking cases anymore because people aren't reporting cases right we can't really track hospitalizations because hospitals aren't even necessarily testing for covid so that data is bunk but wastewater tests the sewer water, and uh, you, when your or your body has COVID, you like shit it out, right? You poo, you pee out or whatever. COVID goes through your body, ends up in the sewers, and then we can measure how much COVID is in the sewers. So wastewater data is kind of like your most reliable source at the moment if it's being tested. Now some places are trying to stop wastewater data because they don't want to know, uh, but you should know. So I use Biobot and analytics. It's still going pretty good. Um, this shows year over year. And can you tell just from looking at it, like which year is which without looking at the thing? Yeah, because it's here and it's here and it's here and it's still here. This is Omicron from 2022. Uh, whoop. That's because we got a mutation that, uh, you know, and that could happen again. There's no reason why this big spike cannot happen again. Um, here's wastewater for right now. This is, shows cases, but again, this data doesn't mean anything if people are not testing, right? This is not reliable data. So here we are right now. That's, you know, did you know about this? I'm just curious if people even knew about this happening, that COVID season, flu season lasts from about October to April or like Octo October to March. Uh, COVID season we're seeing now lasts about from June or July through April. Like there's just like this little dip here, maybe, but just still not that little. Okay. Um, let's go back to this it's a vascular disease it gets worse every time you get it it's doing damage to your blood vessels which means it damages any organ in your body that could be your skin so that could be uh rashes it can be your brain so that's dementia that's stroke it can be your heart and cardiovascular system so that's heart attacks right that's blood vessel that's blood issues like clotting it could be your uh stomach so that's gastroparesis you can no longer eat correctly right it can it can damage um, your genitals, so you can no longer get proper blood flow to your genital organs, and you know what that means. So um, it can literally, it, it's bad. It's a really bad, and people don't want to like, it's scary. It's scary. It's hard to like deal with it, but the fact is that like, if you don't admit that that's what's happening, like you're just leaving us and your children and everybody else to be dealing with this because you don't want it to be bad because you would rather believe that it's not bad, right? And like, I get that, but again, that's like fascism right there being like, it's actually not that bad. It's only killing people who it should be killing. It's only killing the high risk folks um, because we believe that there is a certain amount of people that it's okay to kill, including uh, the, this, the disease, like including disabled, incarcerated, uh, black, poor. We don't care if they die, that's fine, right? And also, I just want to like throw in right here that the front lines are so disabled, you guys. And this is something I want to talk about. Um, and I think we can end the recording here to talk about this because it's just wild. It's it's wild to me how disabled the front lines against Nazis are, and people are don't not aware of that and don't really want to talk about it. And I I think that's interesting. So okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Stop sharing.